lieutenant looked like he was asleep. Then he always looked like that. As for me, my nerves were as jagged as a toothache. My eyes were sore from squinting against the sun and beads of sweat. I was so jacked up I thought I could hear everything within a half mile radius. And I could feel the enemy in the village up ahead. I was peeking over the lip of a ditch that was half full of water. I hadn't moved in a half an hour, and I wondered if I'd live to see another day. And while I was lying there, three distinct memories drifted through my mind. I remembered everything about each one of them. They all had to do with times in the past when I was in serious trouble wondered if I'd get through it. Then my dad's face appeared, because he'd said the same thing to each incident when I asked him for help. He said, don't worry about it, son. You'll get through it okay, because you're a good person. You're going to amount to something. And I always did get through it. And then it occurred to me that I'd never thanked him for that. I'd never thanked him for saying that to me. Just then something flashed across my field of vision and I come back to the present real fast. I could see three VC up there in the village carrying automatic weapons. They disappeared into a hooch. I looked over at my good buddy Digger. He'd seen them too. The rest of the squad was flanked off to the right. The lieutenant gave me and Digger the high sign. We slithered over the lip of the ditch and started snaking through the seagrass toward the village. When we was about five yards away, we hugged the ground. We could hear him talking inside. Digger had that half smile on his face that he always had. I'd already jacked around into my sawed-off 12-gauge pump shotgun that I used for close-in fighting. Me and Digger looked at each other for a second, then we nodded, both jumped up at the same time and run for the hut. I dived through the window. Digger went through the door. There was five of them leaning against the wall. Digger opened fire first, stitched some holes in three of them and spouted blood. I did the fourth. The fifth one was too fast. He jumped up and fired point blank at Digger. Digger was jerked back like he was on the end of a rope and there was a hole in his chest the size of a baseball. I leveled my shotgun and fired, pumped and fired again. What had once been a VC disappeared from the waist up in an explosion of flesh and blood. Digger lying there looking up at the ceiling. I figured it was the last thing he's ever going to see. He still had that half smile on his face. His mouth is moving. I leaned down and put my ear to his lips and he whispered to me, Indiana. And his eyes rolled back in his head and he died. And just like that, the best friend I'd ever had in the world was gone. Then I heard the lieutenant out in front blowing his whistle and guys running around and mortar shells going off and automatic weapons firing and realized we'd been suckered into an ambush. I threw down my 12 gauge and unslung my ball at 223. I jacked in around and set her on full automatic. There was no way they was going to get away with this. Just before I run through the door, I thought to myself, all right, all right. Let's rock and roll. About eight months later, I come back to the world. 
I landed in Seattle and took off from the airport without saying hello to the U.S. of A. or goodbye to the Army. I bought a little old pickup truck and drove the thousand miles down to the little town in California where I was born and grew up and married my high school sweetheart just after graduation. I kissed her hello. We hugged each other so tight we thought our bones would break. Then I took my little boy and we drove out to the desert to see my dad. It was a hot, dry morning. The sun was just coming up. We drove through the little desert town of about a thousand souls and turned off on the dirt road that led up to his house. I was determined to tell him how much his words had meant to me and how they'd saved my life. Rooster tail of dust billowed up behind us as we drove up the road and I could see a little old desert shack just nestled up there against the buttes. The sun was just starting to hit it. We pulled up, got out, and stopped. The door was hanging open on one hinge. All the windows is broke. Sand had drifted in and a lizard run out. My little boy found a family of mice living in the stuffing of my dad's favorite chair and was looking out over the long, empty desert. A neighbor come by and said that he died a couple months before. He just quit being the smiling, crusty old gent they all knew and loved and just give up. No one knew why. I started going through his stuff and found some things that reminded me of him. Like the time he took two days to build a kite and never did fly. Or the time he bandaged my knee and made me laugh while he was doing it. Or the time we sat side by side on the couch looking at a picture book of castles in England and he told me a little bit about each one of them. He loved them so. My little boy said, hey, Dad, what's this? And he, he handed me a crumpled up piece of paper. The mice had chewed some holes out of it. I uncrumpled it and had mimeographed words on it. It said, we regret to inform you in a mouse hole and then in action in the service of his country. Suddenly I knew why my dad had died. Those people in the government and the army hadn't managed to kill me, although they'd tried hard enough. But their stupid mistake had made my dad think that I had died. And he'd failed in his dream for me. Suddenly life didn't seem worth living for him anymore and he'd just give up. While I was standing there, I, I suddenly saw in my mind's eye who the real enemy was. These worthless little people in the government trying to intrude their useless ideas into the lives of decent people. I could see it happening. And I picked up my little boy and held him close and looked out over the long, empty desert. And I thought to myself, all right, all right, let's rock and roll. Oh. 